The first one I'm going to do, uh, the question is uh, Matthew 27, verse 5. Um, I'll read that for you. Uh, and throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he, being Judas, departed, and he went and hanged himself. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then <clears throat> Acts chapter 1, verse 18. Now this man, speaking of Judas, acquired a field with the rewards of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. How many of you have read that to your children? <laughs> That's usually one you kind of brush over. Um, so how does, um, how do these two verses not conflict? Okay. Um, now, admittedly, I work from the premise that God's word is truth. That all God's word is truth. And that God's word does not contradict itself. And, and you can look at these and, and uh, if we leave it right here, uh, well, did he hang himself or did he fall and burst open? Did he own the field or did he not own the field? Because you read in Matthew 27 the verses preceding and the verses following, uh, and it says that the Pharisees, the, the chief priests, when Judas felt remorse and he went and he threw the money down, um, and then he went and hanged himself, they took the money and they said, well, we can't keep this because it's blood money. And we got to do things right, you know. And so they bought a field. Um, and uh, so th there's, there's Matthew's picture of what went on. In Acts, uh, we see that Judas bought the field or, or acquired a field um, and fell over and all right um, here's what I think is happening okay so so this is Glenn's interpretation this is Glenn's commentary all right um, both of them Sally, what did I just do? You punched him lightly. <laughs> you poked him. What's that? You poked him. Ben, what did I do? Poked him and then tickled him. <laughs> Who's right? <laughs> well, they're both right. They both write on different parts, but they're both right. Benjamin could see because he was sitting right here. Sally could only see the movement of my upper arm. I didn't hit him, I poked him. <laughs> this was the dreaded finger of poke for my children. Um, here, here's what I think is happening, okay? Luke, who was not present at this event, he went out and he interviewed people that worked, okay? That's where we get the book of Luke and, and the book of Acts, and they're really just two parts of the same story um, that, that he went and he interviewed, and he did an incredible research. <clears throat> Matthew was there, not necessarily at the field, but he was there in the city and heard what was going on, and, and uh, you know, that, that's kind of big news. Um, so I think what we're seeing here is each of them operating off of different views. Um, this is, you know, actually Proverbs says that uh, when a man steps up and testifies, everybody believes him until the next person stands up and testifies, okay? Um, I think Matthew, uh, who is not really trying to go into detail about Judas other than to say what, what you know, it ended up, uh, Luke is trying to get more of the story as to how it happened. We know that uh, the field was at some point in his name. Uh, I can see a number of reasons how this would be plausible. The first is that we know that Judas was pilfering money from the, the, uh, 
the, the coin purse. He was the keeper of the money, and, and they actually say, you know, he used to snitch the money and, and buy things for himself. So perhaps he had snitched money from the coin purse and, and went and bought the field. Uh, the other thing is he had made an arrangement with the chief priests to sell out Jesus, and so he was using that income to conduct a transaction whereby he would purchase the field. Um, what I personally think, uh, I think when the chief priests um, took the money and they said, well, it's blood money, they saw that he had went and hung himself, so they bought that field as the pauper's field and bought it in his name, in memoriam. Okay? Now, one of the things, so, so how the field came to be that, there's several options as to how Luke came under the impression that he acquired the field. Um, the other thing is, you know, how did his death happen? Well, Matthew specifically says that, that his death was by hanging. But if you look at Luke, he doesn't actually say that his falling over and his bowels spilling out is what killed him. If I fell over and my bowels spilled out, <laughs> just leave me alone, let me die. <laughs> all right? I don't be putting things back. All right? So, but science actually, medicine actually indicates that this is what happened. Uh, Judas hung himself, and there was some time in which he was dead, and his body was getting putrid, okay? It was rotting, okay? Um, gases and weird things, because you know what we don't see is we don't see the time frame between when he hanged himself and when his bowel spilled out. We don't know um, when they actually purchased the field. We, we don't know how any of this went about. Um, we do know that scripture says, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. It's, uh, I think, with purpose that Judas hung himself on a tree. I think that was uh, living out the curse, the, the man condemned. Um, I think after a time, whether it was the rope or the branch or somebody was trying to get him down, I think they, they cut him loose and down he fell and because his body was, was uh, putrid, we get a graphic verse, okay? Um, I don't see these as contradicting each other at all. I see these taking different components to the same story and meshing them into one narrative, okay? So that's, that's the first one. Um, all right, Diane. I had these ready for you last week. Sorry. No, no problem. This was actually an interesting one because... Um, let, first, let me read the question. If you have your Bible, flip open to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> I'm only going to get one of these done today. Um, so, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. Okay? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 3. I'm actually going to back up. I don't like reading things out of context, so I'm going to back up and read a little bit prior to this verse. Okay. Uh, when one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Okay, so we see um, this, this is in a, a 
middle of a passage of 1 Corinthians, Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. He's talking about the goings on uh, in the church. All right? So, um, he has listed a number of issues uh, that have been brought to his attention that need to be addressed. This is one of them. Uh, the, the fact that there are lawsuits, brother against brother in the church, and not even uh, bringing them before the church, but taking them to unbelievers. Um, I think this is something that the church in America should heed, because I see more and more of this kind of garbage happening, where, where there is some kind of conflict within the church, and instead of dealing it with it within the church, well, I'm just going to sue you, okay? So we, we turn the matter over to lawyers and judges, uh, most of whom are not interested in the godliness of the thing. So uh, now the, the particular question is verse 3. Do you not know that we are to judge angels? What does that mean? I don't know. Next question. <laughs> no, really? I, I actually had to do quite a bit of study on this because this, these two passages that Diane has given me have been ones that bothered me for a long time. So I'm, I'm again, I'm telling you what I think. Okay? Um, you, my grandfather um, had, had a couple sayings about opinions. Okay? Um, the first was that Everybody is entitled to my opinion, okay? All right, and the other one is, um, I, I have to modify it a little bit because my grandfather was not saved. Uh, he said opinions were like a certain part of a person's anatomy. Everybody has them and they all stink, okay? Um, so what you're getting today is my opinion, okay? Um, Context. This verse, we have to keep in the relative context. Okay? The context being that Paul is addressing particular issues in the church. Okay? Um, he makes two points concerning um, the responsibility of the church handling its own matters. Okay? He draws two illustrations. The first is that the church is going to judge men. Okay? Now this is a kind of an interesting one because in James we see that there is only one judge and one lawgiver. Okay? So that, that kind of gives us a little bit of a tweak on this thing. The second illustration is um, we are going to judge angels. So, so how does this work if uh, Scripture indicates, and, and there's a number of passages, uh, John chapter 3, again, if you want to see a copy of this, I'll get it to you. I'm, I'm just going to run through these real quick. Uh, Isaiah 24, 2 Peter 2, Jude 1, um, they all refer to God being the judge, not us. Okay? So, what is this? Scripture doesn't contradict itself, so are we judging or not? Well, I think the problem is the particular interpretation of the word that the Greeks used. Okay? Um, the, the, the word is krino, okay? And it can be interpreted as judge, okay? Um, but it carries with it the idea um, to rule or govern to separate or contend. Okay? So depending how it's used in the passage, one of these meanings will be applied and, and translated into English. Now I think what Paul is saying is not that we are going to replace God as the judge of mankind and as the judge of the angels. I think what is really happening here goes right along with us being co-heirs with Jesus. One of the things is when you're an heir, um, you have authority. Okay? Um, you you uh, have the entitlement of 
everything the other heirs do. Now, let me, let me just add this caveat first. Um, I believe that scripture gives us a prototype of what's in heaven. The firstborn um, was always given a double portion. Okay? Um, that, that was to represent the strength of the Father in the next generation. Uh, Jesus being the firstborn will get more than we get. All right? But we are still adopted in. We are children. We are co-heirs. Now, I think in some way, okay, um, when God created us, he put us over all of creation. Okay? That, that was our job. We, we were supposed to, to steward it. We were supposed to husband it. Um, we know um, sin came in. We know that God enacted a plan that he had before uh, the foundation of the world. Um, what, what else is going on here, though, is that angels long to look into this whole thing about salvation. Okay? Because before man fell, angels fell. Okay? And, and we see there's a number of passages and um, we see things that went on. Um, angels are ministering spirits. Okay. Uh, we know that angels, uh, uh, angels of children, always see the face of God. That to me, that's an amazing passage. Uh, the, the, the ministering spirits, to my children, my grandchildren, to see the face of God. Okay. Um, I believe uh, the angels do not become co heirs they did not, salvation was not given to them. It was only given to man. And I believe that when this transition takes place, when Jesus comes, he claims his own, and, and we are transformed in a moment, I believe that we will judge as in rule or have authority over those mankind and angelic beings. Now, here's the dilemma. This is where I, I'm... I'm I am sharing with you my ignorance. I have no idea what that's going to look like. I, I, I have no clue. Um, I don't know if, you know, um, okay, today's your turn to oversee 10 of the seraphim. I, I don't know. I'm not even going to speculate because, um, you know, mind has not seen, I has not seen, mind has not conceived. Okay, so that's what I've got for this one. All right. Um, if you would like a copy, let me know. Um, I'm not giving you this week because I'm going to answer the other one next week.